name is Sasha. I work in Mailgun, uh, work on Mailgun infrastructure. Um, and today I will tell you about VulcanD and its CD, um, and mostly about how can you do achieve dynamic backends when using its CD uh, as a configuration backend. Um, so again, um, I work in Mailgun, and Mailgun, um, if you don't know uh, what it is, uh, is email service for developers. And as we are service for developers, we're all about API, and we do a lot of work on the API, making our API better, you know, uh, making sure that we can actually release API faster. So, and this project is exactly about that, how we think we can make our APIs better, like using etcd for configuration management. Uh, and let me tell you more about this load balancer a little bit. Uh-oh. <laughs> so, uh, let me Let me shrink it then. It's actually not that bad. So I think um, this load balancer uh, is an experimental load balancer, first of all. It handles HTTP. And the way it works, um, it listens for changes from each CD cluster. And if you don't know what CD cluster is, each CD uh, is a daemon and service that spans across, across multiple machines to give you a consistent and distributed, highly available view into your configuration and provides you with the serialized changes. So you can actually listen to your CD cluster to get serialized events, uh, which is really good. So the Vulkan daemon attaches to each CD directly through uh, each CD API and listens to all the changes to configure itself as the changes occur. So Vulkan itself at least, uh, pr connects to and uh, like routes the traffic to a series of the endpoints and the backends. So there is no need to restart Vulkan, and that's actually why I started the project. Like I was thinking, okay, how can we do um, implement a service that reconfigures itself automatically on the fly without sending it hub signals or anything like that, so it can control it. Um, so we'll spend a little bit about um, tell you a little bit more about terminology so you can understand. Uh, the terms that I use better. So Vulkan uh, is configured very much similar to Nginx or Apache in the way that first, and the way it match services every request. First of all, it matches the host uh, of the request. And if you want to support multiple hosts, you can add multiple hosts to Vulkan daemon. Once the host is, ma is matched, the next thing that is being evaluated and matched is actually URL, like the path portion, portion and it's called location. So one host can have multiple locations. For example, you have search location and you have user's location. So these are all different locations. Then uh, every location can be attached to the upstream. Uh, and upstream is very similar to the way Nginx handles upstreams. So basically upstream, you can think about it as a collection of endpoints. You can have multiple upstreams, like multiple name collection of your endpoints. Uh, an endpoint is just a, like real service that actually listens uh, on particular interface and port uh, to provide the uh, actual service. So you can have multiple endpoints per upstream. The way it's done uh, is, like you'll see a little bit later, but basically the overall idea, you can swap upstreams and think of your upstreams as a name collection of your endpoints. Um, if you have any questions so far, you, you can just you go ahead and ask them. Um, so you said on uh, support HTTP, what about HTTPS? Yeah, so as that is coming. Um, this is honestly is not... Um, my immediate goal right now, just because we use it for internal endpoints and we're working on stability, so I don't want to trick you into thinking it's actually extremely production ready just by releasing uh, support or HTTPS. But that's definitely um, something I'm working on. So n now it's time for demos. Um, Okay, so first of all, um, I already spinned up uh, ECD cluster uh, on the back and already spinned up a series of endpoints, just not spend time on those. Um, and there's a total four different endpoints listening on the local host and different ports. And they respond like, okay, one, okay, two, okay, three, okay, four. Um, so the first thing we might wanna see is, um, the status. So status command is basically just calling command line utility. So it will display every time you call it, it will show you something like the real time stats about the Vulcan. 
So there's nothing happening right now, but just, just basically, uh, as long as we do something, probably something will show up. Uh, and it will be blipping a little bit just because Emacs handles inside terms, so don't worry about that. Um, so basically, next, I would probably call init. Um, and the way I'm doing that right now, um, I'm configuring Vulkan through, through its CD directly. So I'm talking to its CD. And if you take a look here, basically what you will see, uh, here I'm creating upstreams uh, and endpoints at the same time using each CD set command. It basically creates a path and sets a value of this path. So Vulkan looks at the path and the value of this path, which is just uh, an address of the endpoint. So I just create an upstream and attach two endpoints. The second set of commands uh, uh, is actually creating uh, location. And the way it does that is just two commands. You need to set a path for a location and the actual active upstream for the connection, uh, for the location. If you have any questions about that, um, you can see that. So once I did that, is basically you may now see something is going on there on the left. Uh, and it's basically Vulkan read uh, all the changes I just executed through CTL and initiated to like location, uh, created host, attached location, and live upstream. Uh, so now I'm just gonna do poll, and poll is just curls the uh, endpoint so you can periodically, so you can actually see something. So what I just did, uh, it just round robins between two of those endpoints. Um, as long as just I have activated just two endpoints, like on the port 5000, 5001. Um, what else can I do? So basically, now I can actually play with different scenarios. Um, for example, this one uh, scenario just adds two more endpoints. to the existing upstream. So now you can actually see they were automatically added and now you have them in your application. So let's say you want to increase the capacity of your application and it just adds upstream that happens sometimes, like to add more service to handle actual requests, you can do that. So um, removing them is probably pretty straightforward. Um, um, it's just calling etcd a RAM command and again, it's just removing the actual value for a given path. Um, so let's remove them. So once I remove them, again, they just disappeared. Um, what else? Uh, the, the other interesting thing you can actually do, like etcd gives you a little bit more than just key value data source, so it gives you an ability to expire things, and then you can actually have a little bit more fun, which is uh, add stuff with TTL. So with, you can create a, a key, and it, after seven seconds, it will just automatically expire. So if it will work fine, we'll see this behavior. So now, uh, let's watch for a while. Fingers crossed. <laughs> I don't know. It didn't work for some reason. But let's pretend it worked. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, yeah. I don't know why it didn't work. So let's move on. So basically, the next step that you can uh, take is changing the upstream. So let's say you release the version of the upstream, which is like version 1, and you release the version 2. So setting upstream. It's also very easy. So this command creates a new upstream, like it's totally different namespace, like it's totally different path. So in this, in this case, U2, uh, and it just, this particular command sets the upstream of the Vulkan uh, particular location with, with this command. So let's hope this one will work. <laughs> no, something kind of went into and loop. I don't know. I can try to restart it. <coughs> okay, I restarted the thing. Let's 
let's move on here. Uh, okay, here we go. So I can add TTL. Okay, never mind. Let's pretend it just all worked and you can magically set up streams and like TTLs. So that will be the end I think, of this presentation. Like as usual, it worked when I presented it uh, to my team. Now it doesn't work for some so reason. What's the advantage of the fun the TTLs? Is it just, to it's just for fun, most likely right now. But theoretically, what like the applications that you can have is, let's say, you want to temper increase capacity and go sleep and then just you know remove this capacity and like decommission servers so you can like add hosts with TTL and then remove them how about you have hosts heartbeat in with the TTL and then when it expires definitely not so yeah anymore. right this is another option so basically whenever your service spins up register itself TTLs it's dead and then it automatically removed auto rotation so that was pretty much it like um, do you have any questions so far go ahead Right. So I spent some work on the error handling and fault detection uh, part of it. So right now, the first step that Vulkan works, it checks the fail ratio of your endpoints, and it tries to split these endpoints into two parts, sort of classify them, like the good endpoints and the bad endpoints. If it was able to classify the endpoints by failure ratio, it adjusts the weights on the better ones. If it was unable to classify them, so basically it will assume, okay, I failed. Either all of them have zero failure rate or all of them failed at the same time, so it doesn't adjust the weights. The second part will be actually adding the uh, actual health checks, but I focused on the first part first to give you something out of the box so you can rely on the failure detection. Hopefully it will work better than the demo, though. Go ahead. Two questions. One, what is it written in? And then the second one is, uh, have you considered its use in being able to split apart components of the URL to work with microservices? This was that part of the design? Uh, so the question is, what was it written in? It's written in Go, and have I considered uh, using it as a part of like having like microservices approach? Definitely, this is uh, what excites us the most: is having a lot of independent microservices talking to each other and automatically registering whenever you expand or shrink the cluster. Yep. There you go. So if I add an endpoint and <coughs> and it's going to request and I delete the endpoint, are those requests finished before I delete the endpoint? Yeah, you don't drop the request. Uh, the thing is, if you'll take a look um, at the API, so what you can actually do, uh, uh, it gives you a bunch of commands, and like, uh, like it gives you one of the commands that you will be interested in. Um, like this one, um, you want. Yeah, so basically what you can do once you did this switch and all your endpoints are out of rotation, like immediate rotation, but there are still connections to them, right? So we don't want to shut them down immediately. What you can do, you can do long polling to uh, basically wait till the number of connections of all the endpoints of the upstream drops to zero, and then you can be safe, can basically safely, uh, you know, restart the, the exact service. So you can do that. traffic to a healthy node if the response comes back from uh, node So the way you handle your errors is very dependent to your application and you can actually write your own plugin for Vulkan to define what do you think is an error because error can be actually, let's say, the you have timeout for your connection and whenever the request takes longer than that, you'll get a timeout or you can get a particular response code from your application which is very dependent. So you can actually define the predicate, like what do you think an error is. By default, it's just a socket error. So whenever you get a socket error, it treats it as a failure because it's like very clearly a failure. But you can add, you know, 500 response time or anything like if the request took longer than this particular amount of sec, like milliseconds, you can think this as an error too. So yeah. So do, do you retry that? Through um, it, by default, the predicate is set up to retry only get requests, bec like because the assumption is your get requests are idempotent, mm -hmm. right? Um, but if you are sure that you, let's say you do puts that can be safely retried because let's say assume you, your request has failed after 100 milliseconds has your operation finished if you will like Vulcan will retry this request for you 
uh, would you create two objects? What would be the state of the application? It's actually up to you. Right now, it follows the Nginx path, which is assuming that your get requests sort of a little bit safer. Um, sort of an alternate design where you configure Nginx but not actually be in the data path? Definitely. So one of the reasons, uh, I actually love Nginx a lot, and we use Nginx uh, throughout Mailgun, and we use Nginx and HAProxy. One of the ideas is basically, A, have some sort of experimental playground where we can have, where we can work on the language with a little bit you know, faster uh, deployment release times than C, because I like C, but it takes me a long time to actually write something meaningful in it. So in Go, it's actually easier. Uh, and uh, the second is have compiling middleware. So for Vulkan, you can actually write a middleware written in Go and rebuild your Vulkan D daemon with the middleware that can rewrite your application. Oh, sorry, rewrite your request, rewrite your response, terminate the response, implement connection limiting, rate limiting. So it's, it's a little bit, gives you a little bit more freedom to experiment, to play, you know, to look at what you can do. Uh, there you go. Sure. Um, so plugin, basically the way it works right now, um, you set up your environment and you work in your environment, um, like your standard like, env like environment. And what you can do, uh, you have a tool called Vulkan Bundle. And Vulkan Bundle, what it does, it uh, takes the Vulkan D, it takes your existing uh, plugins that you wrote. Let's say you wrote your own authorization plugin and it compiles them and like puts like basically writes a tiny Go program that imports Vulkan D as a library and imports your uh, plugins as well in itself. And then you have basically your own plugin system in, like incorporated. Uh, so you, what you can do with this later on with this program, you can use GoDaps if you use GoDap management on it, or you know you can push it to your repo and control it there. Um, and basically, the way the plugins work. Um, if you'll take a look, for example, you can do your own plugin and Vulkan will recompile itself and will build API for you. Uh, will build, like, look, like, for example, command line utility for you with checks. Uh, will, and basically, uh, will add support for backends for you as well, like serialization, deserialization. So you can actually pretty much do whatever you want in your middleware. Uh, and implementing a middleware is just implementing an interface that does something with your request. So you can take a, uh, take a look at the documentation. Actually, all this is written um, uh, here. So there is a, I, it's, don't worry, it's, uh, despite of the fancy name, it's still experimental project. So it's like www.valkanproxy.com. It was an easy domain to buy. But all this uh, middleware thing is written there. So you can take a look there. Uh, there is an example of how can you do like your own auth or your connection limiting, bandwidth limiting, and things like that there. Right, so the state of the art right now, I wrote, uh, I covered pretty much everything by unit tests and functional tests and black box tests. Uh, right now I'm actually doing exactly uh, like crashing Vulkan basically with all these, you know, races, air conditions and things like that, exactly what you saw there. <laughs> That's what I'm doing right now. Uh, any other questions? No? Okay, thanks for your time. <laughs>